as, as, a, as a teacher that works a lot with middle school and high school students, I frequently get called in by frantic band directors uh, for that, that two weeks before solo and ensemble, there's a quartet that needs to be fixed or maybe has rehearsed once, but they're planning on doing it. Um, and, and you get called in and you're supposed to fix everything in uh, well, one to maybe two, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, coaching sessions. And I think we've all been in those situations before. So sometimes you're starting a group uh, from, from the get-go, uh, the first time they ever get together. Um, or you might be in a situation where you're working a summer camp and you have a week to work with a group of students that maybe have never worked together before. Um, or maybe you're a, a pro and you're getting together with some colleagues and you want a way to sort of break the ice and, and try out some different kind of communication exercises. So um, these, these exercises and tips uh, are kind of designed to work with, it, with someone at any level um, and hopefully inspire you guys to have some tools moving forward. And especially today, how I'm going to be doing this class are exercises that you can do in a Zoom type environment. Because what's really been tricky is how do you teach communication and, and chamber and ensemble exercises through the internet? Um, there are some things that work well, there are some things that do not work at all. Like you're not gonna get a quartet to tune online. Like that's not gonna happen. So I'm not gonna be spending the day teaching you guys how to tune a quartet. That's not, that's not going to be effective. But there are some things that I found that work really well um, to sort of get uh, the mindset for what, what sort of things we want the ensemble to be able to do, the tools to get those things accomplished, building awareness, um, building some listening skills, and definitely the most important thing is communication. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. I have a few slides to start out um, before the real fun begins. Um, and can you guys see my screen? A couple head nods would be awesome. All right, great, thank you. All right, so this is starting the saxophone quartet, I, and um, we'll get to it. So here, here's what I'm talking about in terms of you have that coaching session. Uh, it could be the initial session that you have or that one-time shot, or you just are looking for a new topic to work with your own studio class, uh, and, and you want to, use some of these principles. So when I'm with a group, especially a group that's new to chamber music, um, I'm gonna emphasize a few points. The most important, starting and stopping. Um, how to start and stop your piece without a third party cueing you off. So this, in, this looks at cueing and setup and how we look at each other, breathing together, um, those sort of things. So looking each other in the eye and studying body movements, those sort of activities. Tuning is obviously important, but probably not something I'm going to work extensively on in, in an online environment. So um, I do have uh, handouts that I would use in terms of like how to tune, um, usually uh, starting with the most experienced player, typically an alto player, making sure everybody's individually in tune and then and then building from the bottom up one at a time with the berry and then building chords. But um, again, this isn't something that works particularly well online. Uh, some things that can work really well are matching style and articulation. Um, sometimes not necessarily even through playing the saxophone itself, but through vocalizing syllables um, and matching styles, just using a, a, common, a common vocabulary. So setting kind of a common language to use. Balance and blend is something we can work on uh, and what really helps is just knowing what your role is in the music at the time. Um, if you have just that supporting whole note, maybe you don't need to be like fortissimo. Maybe you can back off a little bit with and support someone with the moving line. So just knowing those little things and we'll, we'll do some score study a little bit to demonstrate that. Uh, and, the, and another goal is just setting up your group 
with rehearsal techniques uh, so that they know what the expectation is for their rehearsal. Um, if you just tell them to practice or get together, that's great, but there's a lot of questions as to what the structure of that rehearsal should be. So giving them exercises to do, some tuning, some cueing exercises, um, specific assignments to practice so that they know when they get into that practice session what the focus of that session is. Uh, that can be really helpful in terms of like, especially if you have a couple coaching sessions set up that the next time you see them, they know what they are supposed to have worked on. Whether or not they do it, who knows, but uh, at least that expectation has been laid down. And then the last thing is getting along. And I, and I stress this because I have seen four of the best of friends start a saxophone quartet and then not speak to each other after the end of a solo and ensemble competition. Like, so getting along in the ensemble dynamic, um, that's a really important thing, I think, for a coach uh, to be aware of and to look out for. And one of the things that can really help is just instilling a sense of democracy, <laughs> perfectly timed for today, but a sense of democracy amongst the group so that everyone feels like they're a contributing factor, everyone's led an exercise, everyone's weighed in or um, given, given their thoughts and been respected. So it's, it's definitely, I wanna make sure that everyone in the group feels as important as everyone else. And that can be as simple as um, having each person take turns starting and stopping the piece or having uh, swapping chairs so that you know a different person sits in that soprano chair. Uh, there's a lot of different things we can do to mix things up to make sure that um, everyone's used to taking initiative and everyone's comfortable speaking up. So those sort of things really matter. You just wanna avoid that one person kind of running the show, um, one person on their phone during the rehearsal, um, you know, that sort of thing. I want everyone engaged. So those are the goals, and uh, here's some things to do to get there. Um, especially, okay, what do we do during Zoom? So creating common ground in the age of Zoom teaching. So some of the things that we'll do today, uh, I like to start out really focusing on communication, and maybe that might take the whole coaching time, and that's okay, because uh, in, in a band room situation or in a large ensemble situation, we're very much used to looking up, looking at one person, um, and now we have to be our own conductors. We have to move together. We have to get comfortable looking someone in the eye. Um, it's always funny the first time I do a mirror exercise uh, because the, the kids will look up at each other and literally just start laughing hysterically, just looking at each other in the face. It's, it's, it, it feels weird. Um, especially since now we're, we're so used to this digital environment or, or not looking someone directly in the eye, it's more important than ever to get really comfortable um, looking at each other and how they move and reacting to that and getting comfortable breathing um, and, and matching. Cueing can be solved very easily if we mirror how one another does it. So that technique can be really, really effective and we can do that via Zoom. That's definitely something we can do. Um, say it. Looking at rhythms or coming up with simple rhythms using the syllables dit, da, dat, and ya. Um, these are some syllables, they all, they're, they're great because they can reference short notes, notes with accents, a regular articulation, and something that's slurred. So if we can say something the same way, then we can try and play it the same way. So singing through something with a common vocabulary um, and groups can come up with their own language. That can be super fun for young, young groups too, like come up with your own syllables as a group so that you can sing through a passage together. Um, I've had groups meow through things before. Uh, I don't recommend that as, as accurate as some other syllables, but at least they were having a good time and that's, that's what it's about. Um, and then some simple exercises, um, playing through stuff. And I'm not gonna use a full saxophone because we all know how reliable Zoom is 
for playing live. Um, so let's not risk that, but we can definitely do uh, a few things. Sometimes you can get away with a couple of simple articulations on the mouthpiece and neck, or at least just like moving it. So if we're gonna work on cueing exercises, we can involve just the mouthpiece and neck um, to show because that fits in the window um, pretty easily and, uh, and we don't have to necessarily worry about the sound cutting in and out. But it gets a lot accomplished in terms of just matching motion. Um, so, okay, so these are some of the exercises I'd like to talk about. Um, knowing the score, doing some simple score study online, uh, and then sampling the product. Um, taking a look at, at, the, at a piece and after, after doing some of these exercises, then watch a, a more advanced group or a professional group um, play and see what, what your group can pick up on and after they've done some of these exercises. What did you notice in that performance? What kind of, th what kind of things were they doing that we just went through in these exercises? Okay. So from there, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see you. So if you guys um, wouldn't mind, uh, if you're present in the room, to turn your video on, because I'd like to do a couple of these exercises with you. Um, just to see how this works. Hi, everybody. Okay, and and it's great because you if you if you want to leave your mute on, I will let you for now. So that is totally fine. But what I would like to do is a couple of mirror exercises. So uh, this would be, and this is this is kind of actually super fun in Zoom. So I'm gonna make a simple movement and I would like you guys to just mirror it. <laughs> All right, so already super fun, um, and now I'm going to call um, Noah. I see you on here. Hi, Noah. I'm going to wave at you. You don't even have to, you, you can unmute if you want, but you can just stay where you are, but can you lead us through some simple movements? That's a good one because I have a sore neck. Okay, <laughs> okay, all right, that's perfect. Um, and so, and that describes my point. I'm seeing a lot of you guys smiling. This is like it's 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 very interactive. And again, whoever you're working with, take turns. Like, put someone else in charge. Like, do the movements. Um, it's a great icebreaker, and it's getting us a little bit aware of just watching each other and moving together. Um, and and this is this is really the essence of cueing. Because um, for those of us that are new to it or not as experienced, it, it can be a kind of a weird thing. Cueing and starting and stopping notes, we have to really see how people move. Um, and so uh, looking up at each other and watching that really, really helps. So if I'm doing uh, a simple body movement and, and facial expression kind of thing to start, then we can start adding in um, a simple br breathing technique. So if I go ta, I, you guys can mirror that back to me. And so I'm going to maybe ask, um, uh, and and because I know you, uh, Cicely, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. And how about Becca? Can the two of you unmute yourselves for me? Um, and uh, I'd like to do just a simple mirror exercise with the two of you. So just using the word ta, Cicely, can you, um, can you just say it however you would like? And Becca, I want you to answer back. Try to mirror exactly how Cicely does it. Ta. Ta. Ta, ta, ta. 
ta 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 all right so that's awesome and you guys were actually more advanced than i even thought you would be but uh can we can we mix this up a little bit more and uh can you add um a motion to that so can you can you think about like modeling not just the how she's saying it but also how she's moving ta 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 Oh my God. Okay. So I want, I could, we could do this all day. It's amazing. That is, that's perfect. Right. Um, so it's, it's super fun, but it's really effective because, um, now we're watching each other's movement. And I like to stress that in great groups, I mean, when have you ever seen a string quartet when they look like a flock of birds, the way they're all moving together or an orchestra, you know, when like people, when musicians are really, really in tune, they're moving together. It's more than just playing together, but it's a full, it's a immersive activity, so that's super fun. Um, so now we're now we can practice. And if you have a mouthpiece and neck, that's the perfect opportunity to get a group to do the same thing that you guys were just doing, but with like a simple start and stop. So to match a cue, it's hard to do it at the same time on Zoom, but you can certainly do just a breathe and release and match the note length or match the volume or try your best to do that. It's even safer though using syllables because as we all know, it can just be a little iffy once you start playing a musical instrument. So I like safety. Uh, and so we're gonna just stick with kind of just vocalizing some things, but it really gets the point across um, and how you can translate it depending on, on everyone's setup at home and, and how you wanna do it. And especially if you have, uh, if you're being zoomed into a saxophone sectional at a, at, a, at a school and the kids all have their instruments, you can do some of these activities where you say something and then they all respond back as a group, which could be really cool and effective. So those are some things that you could do um, if you're at a distance and you're with people that actually are together with instruments in the same room. But otherwise, I try to stick it like just pairing people up into pairs because that's like a nice give and take. Um, and and that sort of thing on Zoom kind of works better than trying to do a full group activity at the same time. So um, so now if, if you come up with, we've just done some mirroring, we've gained some trust, we've moved together and been silly, um, and now it's coming up with uh, rhythms and coming up with rhythms and talking about the emotional intent behind them. So, and what I mean by that is, and you are already being uh, super expressive with the way you were just saying ta, but if we come up with some common syllables, and I'm using dit, D-I-T, dat, um, da, and ya. And ya is great if you're doing something that is slurred. So if I think of a simple pattern, like no, no more complicated than quarter notes and eighth notes, and I say, uh, start a start a steady beat here's my pulse dit 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 what kind of note would you expect to see on the page hayden what what kind of articulation would you expect to see you must unmute yourself my friend <laughs> sorry uh i said a staccato yeah a staccato um yeah, I'm gonna pick on you for a minute so you can stay you can stay un unmuted because um, I need I need I need the interaction. Okay, so so if I said that or um, now I want you to think about uh, oh yeah dit da dit da what would you see? Maybe a staccato accent staccato accent. Exactly. So that's the idea. Or if I go dit da ya dit da ya. Um, I'd say staccato and two slurs. Yeah, staccato, two slurs. So some simple articulation patterns, but um, by saying them, it's going to be much easier to play it back with the same style. I actually use this in teaching all the time. 
um, because when when kids are working on articulation patterns, it fixes things immediately if you make them say those articulations with a real mindfulness over the length of notes. Um, and I say this uh, that I teach it, but I also practice that way because I need to pay better attention to my articulations as well. Um, so, uh, so what you can do if you guys all have a minute and you and you kind of want to think about um, some syllable patterns. Uh, I'd like you to think of a simple four beat pattern of articulations that could be done to show excitement in music. So think about like a, a articulation pattern with dit, da, dat, and ya that might show excitement. I'll give you a second. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you've come up with something simple or that you could spontaneously come up with something simple if called upon. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Bobby and Nicole, can I call on the two of you? Yeah. Unmute yourself. Okay, awesome. So this is fun. Uh, so Bobby, you gave me a thumbs up. So what I would like you to do is say your pattern and Nicole, I want you to uh, just say it back. So try to match this more prolonged statement. Okay. Um, da di da 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 da. Da di ya da 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 da. Did she get it right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nicole, can you say yours, and Bobby's gonna mirror it back. Uh. That same phrase, um, and say it in a way that's maybe sad. Okay, so what did you do to make that sad? Uh, just tried to make it, I guess, longer, less staccato. Okay, so you made the notes longer and you also slowed it down. All right, so thinking about what are the elements that would make something excited, we have a little shorter notes, we have more accents, maybe the tempo's a little faster. We had that same statement, we made it sad by slowing it down, making the notes a little bit longer, right? Maybe taking some of the accents out. Um, so. So do, kind of getting into to ways to do that. Um, you can use the same phrase um, and, and totally change the emotion. And again, we're doing all this without saxophones. So it's kind of fun to really think about that um, before you even, before that group even plays a note together, they're already thinking in terms of emotional content and what the articulations might be signifying in the piece that they're playing. Um, and, and so now we can come into uh, an exercise that I really like, uh, and that is a call and response type of exercise. Um, so I might do, let's see. Um, let's see. James, are you on board? Do you have visual? Or are you just hanging out? I'm here, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and let's see, um, maybe I'll call on, uh, is Noah available? Maybe. Oh, anyway, uh, if not, that's cool, man. Uh, James, let's, let's us do something. Uh, sure. So um, what I would like to do is um, a simple uh, call and, and now a response. So if I say, dit, da, yeah, dit, dit, da, I want you to respond with your own rhythm and variation, but keeping the same emotional intent. Okay. All right. So I'll do that again. Dit da ya dit dit da. Di ya dit 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 da. Da da dit dit da da da. Da 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 da. Di 
da 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 da. Die da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Exactly. All right. Now we're just talking phrasing. And without even really addressing it, uh, the end goes up, you are finishing going down or, or mirroring. So again, just how things work. And we'll hear these elements in the music that we play, whether it's, you know, so we're matching style. And then are we starting a phrase? Are we finishing the phrase? Are we, are we repeating what someone is doing? Are we finishing their sentence? So these kind of activities are super great. Um, just to bring awareness to what's going on in the music that we're playing. Uh, and again, it's fun. I, I think just about everybody, I've involved all of you uh, in, in a different way today. So everyone's like participated. Everyone's done a little something. I think that's really important um, so that everyone feels that they, they got it. They were important, right? And they were important in the, in the class. Um, and so, so these are definitely stuff that we can do, and, and again, I, I, if you guys all had mouthpieces and neck, we could do the same thing, even on just a mouthpiece and neck without even worrying about notes or, or anything. So it's a great equalizer too. If you're in a room full of people of different ability levels, you can have you know, saxophone professors and sixth graders doing these exercises back and forth. If it's a mouthpiece and neck, as long as you can make a sound, we can do this, right? So it's a great equalizer in terms of you know, the types of kids you're working with. Sometimes we get those environments where we have a saxophone day and you've got college kids and middle school students. Um, these, are, these are great things to do and everyone really does learn something. I mean, I, I learned something even just doing this, so it's totally great uh, for everyone to do. Um, so what I'm gonna do uh, uh, now, oh yeah, one more, one more exercise that can be good. We were matching some melodies, doing some call and response. Um, this one's a little bit more tricky uh, to do very, it's risky. The risk level is going up just slightly uh, for this one, but um, it's thinking about doing someone doing a melody and what could somebody do underneath that to support it. So if I'm doing a melody, what could you do underneath to support? What kinds of things could we do to support a melody? Uh, I'm going to call on Cecily again, again, because uh, she's got that wicked background. Um, that tapestry is kind of killer. I'm digging it. So uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Thank okay. you. All right. So let's do this. Uh, you're also next to me on my Zoom profile. So that's kind of cool. Um, I, don't, I don't know how it looks for everyone else, uh, which is always such a risk and gamble. But anyway, um, so if I do a melody, what are some things that, that are good signs of an accompaniment role? Like, what would you expect to see in music if you had an accompaniment role? Uh, my line wouldn't be quite as busy, typically. Uh, I might have a lower dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, I might be lower in my range. Uh, yeah. My articulations might not be quite as busy. So it's probably not going to be as busy. Uh, it might be softer dynamically. Um, and I always point out, like, like a good accompaniment, it could uh, a way to support a line could be uh, a, a drone, like a steady pitch to support a moving line, or um, something that a, a steady repeated figure. You know, those are two things that are pretty easy to do uh, in a group situation. So um, I might say, can you just uh, can you just give me a pitch, uh, a steady pitch? Uh, and sing it, and and this was this would be really great, actually. Um, actually, no. I do you have a, a a mouthpiece and neck, Andy? I do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You saved the day. You're perfect. Okay. All right. So let's That's try this. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna risk Zoom breaking the internet by both playing simultaneously at the same time. Um, but when you are ready, can you just give me a steady pitch? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Slap that read on. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I should have just had you. Well, no, I guess I couldn't have had you just come over. That would have been risky. Yeah, it would have broken quarantine, and that's not the point of this session. That's true. I don't have a fancy mask either. I just have a regular mask. Oh. Yeah. 
I just washed all my masks, so that would have been uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm <laughs> drying. So, um, okay. So can you give me like, uh, let's do a, a, a steady drone. So I would have you just play a pitch on your mouthpiece and neck. So it's just something like that. Again, it doesn't work too well, right? Yeah. So again, you guys are probably like, ah, it's crazy. But um, you could say that would be an accompaniment if I had a melody going. Or um, I could play, I, I should have thought of this, I could actually play something through my audio and then have you support that melody. That's also something that could work really well. Um, so if I was just playing uh, a simple melody, uh, then you could accompany it. Or I could have you guys all just try and come up with your own patterns to accompany a melody. Um, I just thought of this now. I should have done that. It was a great idea. Um, but you and you guys go teach this class. You can do that at home. So uh, maybe record a melody and then have everyone come up with a way to accompaniment or, or support that line so that we can talk about roles. Uh, so you can talk about accompanying roles versus melodic roles. And we've already talked about it a little bit, but I think that it's good to just sort of do those exercises. Um, this is an exercise. I did a lot of study on string quartet pedagogy. I did a lot of reading because it's so it's so rich. There's actually a lot of books and uh, and, and articles and stuff written. String string quartet and, and string ensemble starts so young in a string player's development. They start in these groups playing by ear very early on, um, and so I found that that their pedagogy is so rich, and there's so much we can take from that as wind players uh, and learn from. And one of the exercises that I thought was really interesting is called Shine the Light. And that's when um, uh, you really dig, a, pick apart a score and see who has the melody. And as you're playing that passage, um, the thought is to think about shining a light on that melody or how your role as a musician is supporting that line. And can you guys all focus your energy to that particular melodic line at the time. So that's kind of where I'm getting at in terms of this, is just how can we shine the light on the melody? How can we support it? Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you guys uh, one more time. I have a score uh, that I think, I think this is a great piece to That is not the Sanjali, but the, the Sanjali Allegro de Concert, it's such a great piece to talk about. Uh, it's like, it's one of those uh, standard, you know, uh, I'm just going to call it a torch song for some reason. Uh, but it's a great piece to, to, to talk about these principles with a young group because it's very transparent in terms of role. Um, so if we're just looking at this piece as a score, before we even play or listen to something, I like to kind of now, after we've done some communication exercises, get in and take a look at a page of this score. Um, and so I would ask, uh, and this one is a little tricky because the, the, it's soprano or alto one. So there's two, uh, the two top lines are really just one part and explaining that. But um, if you look at this line, um, is there, a, you know, is there somebody, is it clear who has the melody? Right? Yeah, I'm saying head nods, right? So our soprano player, and for this piece, it's really a soprano show, but um, they have a moving line. It's more lyrical in nature. And then by definition, we have uh, our inner voices doing just repeated notes. So what's their role? It's a supporting role. So we have our leading role, we have our supporting role, and then the, the bottom line also doing some arpeggiating re, uh, repetition. So you can really take a look at, you know, who's leading at the time. Okay, so we're going to be following our soprano. Um, and, and then we have uh, one of my favorite moments right after A, the brief moment when the tenor has the melody. Uh, and as, as frequently the tenor player in a quartet, it's like my favorite, like three bars of this piece, because for a couple of seconds, the soprano player just has a long note. Okay, so pointing this out, right here we have uh, the passing of a melody. All right, so we're passing the melody off. We want to make sure that as a soprano player, you're not just screaming over top of that poor tenor player that only has a measure and a half to play that beautiful piece. 
Um, and as we go forward in the score, we get to a few moments where there, there is some actual trade-off, um, especially between the berry player and the soprano. So going into this section, the berry player now has a solo, and that gets passed on to the soprano player. So going back and forth or to some other voices, we have this passage of a melody, what we were just doing earlier with passing off and finishing each other's sentence. So those ideas then put into a score form. Um, so we can dig in a little deep and just talk about, again, looking at dynamics, looking at articulations, and then even saying some of these articulations, like how would you, inner voices, how would, what syllable would you use for this passage right here? Would you use dat? Would you use da, da, da? Or would you use dit, 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 dit? And get them to agree on what syllable they want to use and then sing through that passage a little bit. Can they match before they even play? Say, then play. Uh, if they're matching with their voice, it's going to be easier to match with the saxophone or at least be aware that they're going to want to try to match with their saxophone. Uh, and then from here, after we kind of look at a few of these examples, it's a great idea to then watch uh, a great performance of the piece. Uh, and so we'll do that and, and just see how after going through these exercises, um, our perception changes. So let's do one more thing. Happily, I have this all set up on my, let's see if it works, because it never, it always works before you start, and then you, you get into the presentation. Okay. So, uh, we even have one of our superstars from uh, this beautiful recording. Uh, so, we're going to take a listen to a great recording of the Sanjale, uh, and and see what we observe.
so many times when I share a recording, I notice uh, students just kind of staring at their part and just seeing if they can follow along. And I absolutely had no desire to look at music. I wanted to watch them. And I wanted to watch how they moved. And, and did you guys, um, Becca, did you notice anything particular that, that stood out to you in that performance that our exercises kind of made you aware of? Um, I remember how we talked about um, how if we went over the articulations and how we wanted the notes to be and how body language um, for starting and stopping together. And I noticed how like, obviously like the last note, they ended together because they were all watching each other. Yeah. And with the um, notes, like when you had that passage in the middle where the, um, I think it was, the no, I think it was the berry. No, the berry was not. It was the tenor and the alto, I believe, but they had the repeated eighth notes mm -hmm. and they both had, they both agreed on how they wanted the notes to sound, so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm just really bringing awareness to, you know, why was that a really successful performance of that piece? Like what, what made that so, what made that so great? Um, and, and yeah, just pointing those out. I loved how they, I noticed how they moved together, like as a group, their, their, their body movements were similar and starting and stopping and, and supporting the melodic line. And we were all listening for the moment when the tenor had the melody. Um, and, and so, uh, little things like that uh, is, is great. And this is, I love this piece because it's, it's, it's the perfect length uh, to really kind of introduce these principles and ideas. So even if you don't have a group that's like necessarily working on it, it's just a, it's, it's just a, a nice, nice, perfect example because our music can be somewhat complicated um, as saxophonists. So it's nice to have something that uh, is like a go-to so that you can use to introduce some of these ideas too. Um, so that's pretty much what I have, uh, today. If you guys, does anyone have any questions or thoughts, um, about, about today or anything I can answer? Yeah, I have one. Um, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> no, that was, that was great. That was awesome. Um, I was, I was wondering, you, you had mentioned, uh, that you had done a lot of reading of string quartet pedagogy and, yes. uh, you know, both books and essays. And, um, I was wondering, um, if number one, if you'd be willing to share any of the resources that you thought were like super valuable in your own studies of it. Um, but two, if, if, you know, one of the things that I've always noticed about um, st string playing, especially chamber strings, is that they're always, always, always out of the score and um, paying attention to you know, like little uh, nonverbal cues all over the place. There's a lot of visual communication there. Do you find that in general saxophone quartet has a harder time with that? It seems to me that the traditions now are moving towards playing a lot more from memory and maybe that's changing it but at the same time string quartets often don't play from memory. So right. is that just part of our culture do you think or is I don't know if you have any assessments of that? Oh I, I think um well, with string playing, I mean, so much has to do with bowing. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's part of large ensemble playing, too, is just like it's following the bowings of the principal player. And I mean, it's just like it's just a lot of ensemble um, has to do with that. But again, I think I think that that we rush into a lot of times we, we enter chamber music playing later. Mm -hmm. We start we take lessons and we're in band, but chamber music for real. I mean, for me, it didn't happen uh, consistently until I was in college. And Same. so now I'm, I'm, I've been playing the saxophone for, you know, 10 years, and then I get into college, and now I'm finally in a chamber group. Um, and, and I think, and then we enter it, and what do we do chamber for? We are saxophonists, so we compete. Uh, and so there's this, this emphasis on learning the hardest music as fast as we can when we don't take the time to do some simple breathing exercises together. We don't take the time to do um, just simple cueing. So I will share one thing. This is, um, uh, I can do that because I have it queued up, but uh, I, I used uh, the art of saxophone playing, there, art, art of saxophone playing, uh, the art of string quartet playing is, a, there's this really great resource. And I can share a brief bibliography with you guys uh, in terms of some of the sources that I found. Um, 
but uh, I, I created, based off of string quartet playing, um, a series of communication exercises for saxophone quartet uh, based off the research that I did, um, which has to do, let's see if I actually have the table of contents, which will be a little easier. Um, so these are the types of exercises I start with, the group breath which is literally a, a, an exercise where you guys look at each other, breathe on beat four and say eyes, the word eyes on downbeat so that everyone gets used to breathing together and looking each other in the eye just to start. Um, ping pong cueing is just, and these are things again that it's great to actually have the resources if you want to use them, but it's even more fun to, to do this without stands at all, um, to just have kids come up with their own cue and then so one person will, will cue across to the next person, or you can go in order, you can go round robin, or you can do a random cue. And you just like play the same cue back around, um, uh, and ping pong a cue back and forth. Um, then some, just some tuning sequences. Um, scale train exercises, which are great, which is when you would take, um, uh, maybe the, you start out by playing four notes and then the next person plays the next four notes and then, and then down to every other note. And I wrote these out because I noticed that <laughs> some groups don't know their scales yet and especially being knowing exactly what note you're supposed to come in on can be very scary. So just having these kind of written out is, is great. Um, match my melody exercises and then um, how to really practice a Bach chorale study in terms of playing it in pairs, um, breaking down that everyone will play their part with the berry player to start, uh, while other people conduct while the other people are playing so you can feel time and conduct. So I have um, uh, exercises that I do with groups when I am like, oh, I didn't, ah, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> cameo by Adorable Baby is always way more cool than what I'm sharing. Um, but so, uh, and these are all things that I, I picked up from um, reading a lot about string quartet pedagogy. These are types of exercises that they do to like build communication and, and things like that. And there's a, just a lot to learn from, but um, the emphasis on just communication to get started and all the mirroring and the theater exercises, those are all ideas I got from string quartet articles. It was like, um, there's uh, working with young groups where, where coaches would spend like the first three or four lessons without instruments even being involved. Like where they're literally just moving um, and doing all these exercises together to study each other's body movements. There's a big emphasis on that. And we, we definitely, I know that I never really thought about that much. Um, uh, and, and, and we both had a teacher that definitely involves movement in pedagogy. So the fact that, 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 that happened, we just don't have that, um, as ingrained, and I think that that's, there's room for that in our own pedagogy. As um, I had Stephen Banks just talking to my, my group the other day, and he was just saying that it's a really exciting time for saxophone because our pedagogy is still developing. Uh, and I think that, you know, in all areas, there's stuff that we can learn and keep improving on. And, and this is definitely one of them is in terms of, of um, bringing, bringing that awareness so that this isn't the last thing we, this is like the last thing we learn now is how to actually move and, and play right. together. And um, the model of playing all your pieces from memory is pretty daunting for some you know, beginning groups. So these are some fun exercises you can do with sixth graders. So, right. <laughs> so I hope that I, that was probably an over answer. I'm sorry. No, that was great. That was great. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah, Bobby. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about um, working on vibrato within the quartet setting. Like, how do you, when you get to working on that, how do you approach that? Um, so uh, there, there are a lot of different conceptions of that, but I think that can kind of go with uh, the shine the light sort of idea. Um, so whoever has the melody, or who has the most important line uh, really needs to be able to express that um, with a with a vibrato, and then the other players, uh, their their line shouldn't overshadow that. It, it uh, typically does sound kind of wonky when everybody in the group plays with the same like pulse of vibrato at the same time. Um, Unless that's what you're going for. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's such a thing of taste. It's very hard to explain. But, but when I work with groups, 
Um, I think uh, it, it can be it can be something that you work on vibrato uh, together as a group so that you kind of have an idea of, of what your group sounds like. So there's some things where if you're playing a scale and everyone's adding vibrato and they're moving together, that's great. But in context of a piece, um, we might want to back off or play with, with a more narrow vibrato or straighter tone while the, the, so, the solo line is projecting. So um, having, having a similar conception of the style that we want to use, I think is great. So if you're working on a piece, um, and it could be piece specific too, like if you're working on the Sanjali, um, you don't want necessarily somebody with a completely different concept of vibrato uh, so that they're really fighting styles, but in terms of who uses it when and to the degree they use it, um, I, I like to think of that shining light principle. So I'm like, okay, Barry player, right now you're the solo, so your vibrato needs to be the predominant sound to cut through, and then everyone else can can just back off or play with like a narrower or straighter tone just to find the balance in the sound. So um, that's what I that's what I typically do. I think it's it, it's great though to find kind of that group sound um, when you have that and when people are matching. Um, you can use that with the match my melody where someone plays that melody and using a vibrato of their choosing and then the next player tries to match using a similar vibrato sound so that we're working on, on listening and matching but not necessarily at the same time. Um, so that's good. Uh, it just, it just it helps that everybody has a developed vibrato. But if they don't, then just play together with scales and we'll all work on the skill together. So that's, that's typically what I do. Um, again, that. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Heidi? I see no hands. That, that uh, is okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. This was really a ton of great information. Awesome. Um, and you know, I'd be happy to share. Uh, this PDF of exercises, if anyone's interested in taking a look, it's, I'm, I, I just want to share. I did this and uh, it's fun to use with groups. So if anyone's interested, um, Nate, I can send it to you. So if anyone wants to contact you about that. Or That's great. I, directly, so. I mean, I can, I mean, if you'd like, once we upload the video, I can just um, put a link to it in the, in the comments below if you'd like. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, thank you, Heidi. Thank you guys. Um, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and, and good luck. Hang in there, everyone. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.